Brian Farrell and I work with Geneva Campus Ministries in Kingston, Ontario. I also work part-time as a pastor where I'm at in my Baptist church right now here in Kingston as well. This morning we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 11. So turn with me if you want to in your own Bible. It's also going to be on the screen. A reading from Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 18. The apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet come down to where I was. And I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds, and then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time, saying, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it all pulled back up into heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying, and the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me and entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for a man, for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but I baptize with the Holy Spirit. So, if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, God grants repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I came to know and follow Jesus as a teenager at a Christian summer camp. Popular in youth groups and camps at the time was this image. It's a pretty graphic picture of the gospel for me because on one side there's me and on the other side is God and there's this, this chasm between God and I that is my sin. And the only way back into a restored relationship with God is via the cross of Jesus where Jesus suffered and died for my sins. So Jesus is the bridge who reconciles me to God. And again, it's a beautiful image of the gospel. But, have you ever found yourself thinking that there isn't just this chasm that there can be between you and God, but there can also be a chasm between you and, well, others? That sometimes you're on this side, and then on this side is your friends, your neighbors, your spouse, family members. And this chasm exists between the two of you, full of sins and frustration and anger and misunderstandings and, 
and sharply differing ideologies. And we wonder, how can I, how can I bridge across this chasm and be reconciled with the other? Well, this morning, we are looking at a story of two folks in the Bible who were divided via, via a chasm of religious, social, and political differences. We have Peter, and we have Cornelius. And there is quite a history of tension between them. First, let's talk about Peter. Now, this is a man who cut off someone's ear when Jesus was threatened. He's kind of like this burly, like quintessential manly man, nicknamed Son of Thunder. Not really the kind of guy people would say has a bleeding heart. And he's still kind of rough and aggressive after three years of following Jesus' way. And then you have Peter, who is traveling from Joppa. Joppa is a city where a few hundred years ago, a man named Jonah, you might have heard of, boarded a ship to sail away from the Ninevites because Jonah was fuming. How could, po how could God possibly be calling those awful, pagan, idol-worshipping enemies of Israel into relationship with him? So Jonah said, -uh, n -n -n, no way, God, no way. And so Joppa became the place of avoiding God's grace expanding outside the borders of Israel. But now we have Peter going from Joppa in the opposite direction to the Gentiles, to Caesarea, the home of Cornelius, also home of hundreds of Roman rulers. This city is actually named after the almighty but blasphemous Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. In the eyes of Rome, it's like the capital city of Israel. It's home of Pontius Pilate, under whom Jesus was crucified. And did I mention yet how much the Jewish people hated Rome? In 63 BC, writes Howard Thurman, Palestine fell into the hands of the Romans. After this date, the gruesome details of loss of status were etched line by line into the sensitive soul of Israel, dramatized by ever-increasing desecration of the Holy Land. Taxes of all kinds increased to note of these funds extracted from the vitals of the people. Temples in honor of Emperor Augustus were built within the boundaries of the Holy Land. It was a sad and desolate time for the Israel People. In other words, Rome is a large, domineering culture colonizing and oppressing Israel. And then there is Cornelius himself. And lest we picture him as this, you know, poor, innocent outsider, let's remember, he's a Roman centurion. Cornelius is a leader in the Roman army. He is helping Rome in their imperial pursuits. And he's a Gentile. He's not circumcised. Under Israelite law, he's unclean. And in the Jewish mind, he's an outsider. So you have Peter coming from Joppa to Caesarea to meet Cornelius. So you have quite the saga. You have one of the most violent, ill-tempered apostles, a Jew by birth, leaving Joppa, where Jonah once fled from the Gentiles, and Peter is heading straight to them. In fact, he's heading into the headquarters of the Jewish people's very oppressors. And he is going to meet with a man who is complicit in this very act of oppression. <laughs> so what happens? <laughs> it seems like a setup for a disaster. What do you think would happen in our time in 2021? Well, what happens when a Christian atheist and Christian and an atheist discuss religion at the dinner table? 
What happens when LGBTQ advocates and traditional believers discuss marriage on a Facebook thread? When um, a right-wing media outlet publishes an op-ed on a liberal organization? What happens when protesters and counter-protesters cross paths? What happens when family members sit down to discuss their differences? When estranged siblings or exes awkwardly meet once more at a wedding or a funeral? I don't think I need to say much about what usually happens in these situations, do I? Most countries have seen a significant increase in divorce claims and counsel during the pandemic. In fact, some have seen a 122% increase. And there's no research I can quote on the rising numbers of church friends, fellow Christians, neighbors, and family members debating, demeaning, dehumanizing, harassing one another on social media. There's no statistics I can give you about that, but we've all seen it. We've maybe even participated in it. I've noticed myself growing more irritable, less patient, more opinionated. We've maybe taken out our worries about job loss, sickness, and isolation on the only people we're allowed to hug. Political polarization, which is not just an American illness, imbibes us into pawns in a global game of chess. A few years ago, LifeWay research found that 8 out of 10 congregations in America are composed of only one predominant racial group. A lot of depressing information, but here's what I'm trying to point out. On paper, Peter and Cornelius's story had had every reason to be another explosion of division, a bomb of vitriol, uh, another Facebook debate, another shouting match, another dehumanizing disagreements, another misrepresentation, another warring of sides, just another instance of relational disintegration on paper. But... That is not what happened. What happened was that Peter and Cornelius rose above their religious and, and racial divisions. They disarmed themselves of violence, of name calling, of foot stomping. And how did they do it? How did they do it? Because my, oh my, however Peter and Cornelius managed to do it, whatever their secret is, the world could surely use some of that. So how did Peter and Cornelius do it? They didn't do it. God did it. The gospel did it. The gospel breaks in and the gospel changes everything. I know it sounds kind of trite, but it's true. The gospel of Jesus, the grace of God, is the active ingredient that defuses the bomb of hostility, anger, and conflict. God is the active agent. The cross of Jesus has two beams, one vertical, one horizontal. Friends, the gospel is not just vertical. Yes, firstly, chiefly, the gospel reconciles us with God. The gospel is also horizontal. The gospel, the gospel reconciles us with others. Through Jesus' burial, death, and resurrection, God is reconciling us to one another. And that's what happened with Peter and Cornelius. Peter and Cornelius had diverse yet complementary visions from God. It's God who says to Peter, eat the meat. It's God who says and commands, do not call anything impure that I have made clean. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who's, who's already softening Cornelius' heart. And it's the Spirit who wells up in Cornelius' soul. And it is the gift of the Spirit that is given to Peter and Cornelius in equal measure. 
Jesus is the object of their belief, the crux of their unity, the overlapping spheres of their diversity. We really, 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 really need to catch how monumental this story is. Don't miss it. Don't miss the jaw-dropping work of God in this passage. In verse 6, Peter is given a vision that changes the course of human history. I looked and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. In other words, in his vision, Peter sees that all foods are now kosher. There is no such thing as clean and unclean. That Jewish distinction is now complete. Centuries of dietary laws fulfilled. Why? Because God is gradually doing this work in Peter to prepare him for something even more radical. Because if Peter cannot fathom eating unclean animals, he's not yet ready to befriend an unclean man, a Gentile man, a Roman, an oppressor. But the Spirit of God is going to bulldoze these walls of division. Because all people are kosher. All people are important. All people are dignified. In verse 12, Peter says, We entered Cornelius' house. Stop. <laughs> That's huge. Rewind to Acts chapter 10, verse 28, when Peter explains farther, It is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter steps across the chasm. There is our monumental moment. There is our Rosa Parks on the bus moments, a conservative and liberal working side by side moments, a criminal making amends moment that just like that, God subverts thousands of years of religious, racial, and political divisions. God erases, wipes out the battle line. God overturns the chess game. God calls Peter and Cornelius to embrace one another. Again, to step over, to cross the chasm. Why? Because God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. God has shown us that we should not call anyone impure or unclean. Oh, how we need the Peter entering Cornelius' home moments today. How we need God to show us that we should not call anyone impure or unclean. Oh, how we need God to help us cross our religious, racial, political divisions today. And he can and he is. Look, if God can reconcile Peter to Cornelius, Jew to Gentile, Israelite to Roman, then he is going to do it for you too. He is doing it for you too. God is in the business of healing marriages. God is softening political polarizations. God is bringing peace in hostile landscapes, even virtual ones. God is reuniting estranged family members. God is helping hurting and splitting churches move forward. God is befriending conservatives and liberals. God is in the work of bringing divided people to a table to share a meal. Because everyone everywhere needs to feast on the broken body of Jesus Christ. Look, if you're at the end of your rope in a relationship, with maybe some exceptions, I want to say maybe it's because you've tried some not so great ways to cross the chasm. You've tried to bring them over to your side. You've tried to yell at them across the gap. You've even thrown stones of accusations. But there's only one bridge. Bridge. 
of Jesus. Jesus reunites us. He opens our eyes to see that no one is impure or unclean because they are cleansed by his blood. God is granting people all around us repentance that leads to life. Everyone, every human being around us is a potential target for the grace of God. Everyone formed in his image and likeness. The Holy Spirit may just be poured out upon them in equal measure. They, they might be a brother or a sister in God's family, even if they're a liberal or a conservative or have a different doctrinal belief than me or wronged me in some way. Look, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't give up on your convictions. I'm not saying give up on your convictions, rather. And I'm not saying stay in an abusive relationship. I'm not saying sacrifice on your opinions. I'm not saying don't speak up when something's not right or okay. But what I am saying is take the gospel seriously in your relationships. Take the gospel so seriously. Because the gospel is not just how God has reconciled us with himself. The gospel is also how God is reconciling us with others. The gospel of Jesus helps us venture over to the other side to see what it's like in their territory. Because Jesus is going to help us see that even though we might disagree, we can still explore their side. We can see what it's like in their perspective, get a, a lay of the land. And who knows? Maybe people might even meet you in the middle, on the bridge. They might meet you in the oneness of Jesus. And you can celebrate your commonality and your union in Christ. So who is your Cornelius? Who is your Peter? Who do you think of and say, wow, look at this chasm between us. Is it possible God is granting you a vision coming from heaven today? A vision that unveils ways you might have wronged them. How you might be standing in the way of God's grace. Peter and Cornelius ate together. The world around them said they shouldn't. The world says that divided and polarized and hurting people can't sit down and drink coffee together. But the gospel says they can, they shall, <laughs> and they will. We can't eat together right now, but we can share life together. We can set aside the screaming, opinions, gossip, social media, blogging, and maybe, just maybe, the Spirit of God will help us to have a real human connection. To step across the gap the world says is impossible through the bridge of Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit is opening our eyes to who the Cornelius or Peter is in our life. Spirit. Do your miraculous work of healing in the divisions in our life. Grant us the courage to see that you, Jesus, have bridged the gap across the chasm. To step out onto that bridge, to take action through your power, to be reconciled and reunited with anyone with whom we are experiencing relational tension and disintegration. God, give your spirit the supernatural ability to be full of love and grace and union in this ever so divisive world and season. Jesus, thank you that you reconcile us to yourself and you reconcile us one to the other. Amen.